what we're standing beside is one of the most undervalued but important national sites in this country because this site tells the story of our national history in, in a succession from Roman to Saxon, Vikings included, Normans and early English. He's charismatic. Well, he's a fearsome gentleman, really. A great leader. He came from a background, obviously, of a sort of senior army officer. The worship in heaven going on above us while we're down here doing the worship down here. He's dynamic. Uh, he gets people involved. William has the knack of sort of inspiring people. He's made us go and do jobs that we never ever thought that we'd be capable of doing. And I would like to spend two or three hundred quid on the trust money marking the site actually, to be honest. If there's something we need doing, he just signed a bit of paper and he was pretty sure that someone would back him up. When he asks him to do something or tries to rope somebody in to be involved. <laughs> Comes up to you and says, Leslie! <laughs> you don't say no. Basically he thinks that um, we should be trying to live the kingdom of heaven here on earth, I think. And that includes everybody, whether or not they can be bothered to go to church. And so, there you are, he gets everybody involved. The St Kynaber Building Preservation Trust was set up to provide funds and expertise for the preservation and improvement of the church at Castor. The trust owes its existence in the first place to the foresight and energy of William Burke. As William retires from Castor, we would like to pay a tribute to his care for this extraordinary building and the community in which it sits. William and Diana arrived with Canon Christie. Um, the door was open. I don't think William went into the rectory. I don't remember him going into the rectory. Diana and uh, uh, Canon Christie went in and William said to me, could we come up to the church? He knew exactly where he'd arrived a parish outside Peterborough, which is also a centre of significant history and archaeology. A church with a tower that was unique in the country and all sitting on a Roman site of national importance. William is, is very unusual in having such a wide knowledge of archaeology. He's got this great passion um, for all things historical. Have you all seen the Roman altar inside the church? Yes! Right. Have you all seen the Roman coins? Yes! And whether he's talking about uh, history to adults or whether he's talking about history and archaeology to children, as he has been recently at the, church, at the, uh, the school, uh, he puts over this infectious enthusiasm for the subject. Which city did the Romans come from? What language did the Romans speak? If you ask what the Romans were really good at, they were good at fighting, they had an excellent, well-organised army. They were good at administration, they could run their provinces their colonies properly, okay, and they were brilliant engineers. William has an unsurpassed understanding of the archaeology, the history, uh, the development uh, of Kynaburgers Church. There's nobody that can touch him. You walk around Kynaburgers with William and you see things that he's seen for a long time, but it's his ability to interpret them. When I have visiting people coming here, I always ask them to touch it. They're touching something from the Shrine of St Kynaburger dating from between 720 and 780 or thereabouts. Do you see? He's got a brilliant academic, local and even national knowledge of all things archaeology, whether it's Roman or Saxon. He's especially interested in the Christian period. So so he knows what he's talking about. We brought time to you here and they did excavations around the church. William was a real catalyst for getting that done. Everywhere I look, archaeologists have found impressive Roman structures. Yeah. Can we dig the church up? We can dig in this church up. Wow. Wow. We've got wow. one day, <laughs> one day, the Dars has given a permission, very excited, we need to grab the charm. And there was William scooting around in that sort of floppy hat he wears and satchel completely stealing the show and it just made me really laugh because there was all these professional TV people and um, William was showing them how it was done actually I thought. I'm getting a feeling that there's something special about Caster. I just thought it was the most boring subject ever until they started doing what they do now and I just find it fascinating and I can't stop looking at Google Earth and looking at all the stuff around here and all the marks and fields and... His knowledge on the village is amazing yeah. as well, especially with the Romans and the, yeah. you know, the, or everything to do with the, the church, the building and... Yeah, the actual structure, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very good. And Phil Harding, um, who is not the snappiest of dressed archaeologists you will perhaps remember, 
he and William had um, quite an interesting conversation about who, during the filming, had the grubbiest hat. I say no more. At the same time as William and Stephen Upex were making Time Team happen, they came up with another great idea. Walking groups back 200 years across Normangate Field and down to the Neen to experience Castor's Roman past for themselves. And that we should take people for a walk around the whole area. And um, seemed a good idea at the time. And, and it made a lot of money for the church. Made a lot of money for the church, actually. And it was actually great fun. Yeah, it, was, it was great yeah, fun. Yeah, and a lot of wine yeah. drunk as well. In the field, standby uh, station road in the Norman Gate field. 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 Yeah. Uh, there's, the, there's a plaque, and it's all about the palace that this church has been built on beforehand. And all the information, the, the fields, and all the industry that was going on. He has been a great inspiration to, um, to just to spring out into the open and to educate us, probably. It's only buildings that have been thought about and um, reordered so that they're relevant to the communities which use them that are going to survive. William understands that people in communities need buildings to meet in, eat, drink and be merry in. And although Castor Church is splendid, there were no toilets, no meeting spaces and no kitchen facilities. This had already been recognised by Charles and Jay Winfrey. But where could such a building be sited? He'd only been here a matter of a couple of weeks and we walked out of the church one morning and he looked over the wall into Dr Dudgeon's orchard and he said, this would be just the place, you know, but it was a pipe dream, of course. And then a few weeks later, William and Dana were invited to have a cup of tea with the Dudgeons. And um, we had tea and I was sort of looking out and looking at the garden, said how lovely it was and was told, yes, but it's too big. What we'd like to do is sell that bit over there. And, um, but there's no access, so we can't. And anyway, we left. I said, hey, Willie, they want to sell that bit over there. And so um, he went straight back and saw them. He said, what do you think? And I said, oh, if we could. Yeah, I think we ought to. So William got a prize and then the generosity of Charles Winfrey, of course, we bought the, bought the land. Once the ground was bought, what should we do? And William, he really was absolutely amazing because for him, he, we didn't know how to find grants. We didn't know who to ask. We didn't know anything. And so fundraising, and sadly for me personally, Charles died and um, a legacy was left for the Cedar Centre. As the Cedar Centre was blessed in the year 2000, there were some serious issues with the east window of the church. I got involved when I was asked to look at this east window, which had some rather um, dire cracks in it, and to see what the cause was. Theo had sort of been monitoring that for years and years and years, and there was a little glass telltale strip above the arch and that had cracked and so we knew it was moving. But we needed to raise money. And so the St Kynaburgh Building Preservation Trust was started and repairing the east window was followed by other repair and care projects. Um, we were involved with the, the new oak fencing that you see surrounding the whole church here. Um, you've got nice English green oak fencing all the way around the church. Um, we've got the, we were involved with the dry rot project um, which is just here. Um, and the involvement on solving that and removing all the stones and the pews and replacing the, the new stone floors. Um, and of course that includes discovering the, uh, the coffin and the foundations. And uh, we've also been involved with some of the, the roofing work and the, the lead work um, on some of the different areas um, where they've had a few problems with, uh, with leaks and things like that. This is such a fabulous church. I mean, there's so much Saxon and uh, early Norman uh, work in it. It really is a, a wonderful church, one of the best in the country. It's made an enormous difference because it's uh, galvanised people who are not involved in the church in the normal way. It's been the largest building in Caster for all this time and it's had multiple uses apart from religious. And people who are not of that persuasion felt that they wanted to keep this building going and keep it in a good and sound condition. And the key thing here is that we will pass this on to the next generation and the future generations in a better condition than it's been for many, many years. Since the Trust started at Castor, 
William has initiated and encouraged other communities to take responsibility for caring for their churches too. These ancient buildings need energy, money and expertise that can be found in the broader community alongside the worshipping congregations. Well, Antonia, I've brought you up onto the roof of Marham Church because uh, I think it gives quite a good example of the project that we've completed in William's time. And it's the nave roof that we're, we're looking at here. 38,000 pounds is what we needed to do it. And I can't stress too strongly um, that it was William's enthusiasm, encouragement, and leadership that, that got us there. And then he had this other idea of doing some sort of nature orientated thing and maybe using Upton Church as a base for that. Like they've done in Sutton, they've now taken out all the pews and they use it as their village centre. William's been one of the key people, probably the key person in terms of bringing that together, whether it's about the church or whether it's just community events. William sees opportunities and the annual summer fete at Castor was one of those. It started before William, yes. Um, but uh, it was a very, very low-key affair. And again, probably because of William's attitude and people like um, um, Julie Taylor would have said, right, things are starting to happen. So she got behind it in a big way. I got behind her and we sort of together sort of helped bring the, the, the fate through into, into what it is now, a much larger event. Um, he asked the question when it was all set out, where is everything going to be? Where's going to be the bar? and um, well, there was this sort of silence. Oh, we must have a bar, we must have a bar. I serve wine every week in church. He said, it's something that Jesus drank wine. We must drink wine and be merry and happy. So the bar was reinstated and I, th I think most fundraising functions, most money's been made through having a bar. And the, the profits split 50-50. The church takes half and the other two quarters go to the village hall and to, Cap and to Casper. And that's another thing typical of William, that um, he's, he can see the, the benefit of doing something like that. He picked up the idea of the rock mass, which was just a fantastic thing, got everybody involved, and uh, including um, quite a lot of the village kids who, who turned out to have a really good band and nobody knew. Shakedown Blues concerts in the church, which has been magnificent. The acoustics are fantastic. And the performers, absolutely, love, most of whom are Americans, I think it's amazing that they're playing in a 1,000, or nearly 1,000 year old building. This is Roman work here. And the he has shown us the way. And, and our job, frankly, is, is to try and, in, in a smaller way, because that's all we're, some of us are capable of, but it is, is, to, is to carry on um, in the pattern that he's, he's set for us. Well, he's left so much, he's given so much of himself. William's ministry here, he's, he's brought out the best in people. And he, he once said to me uh, that um, a chap called Alan Billings, who was principal at Cudston when William was there, he said, Christ turned the water into wine, don't you be the one that turned it back into water. And I think we must, we must carry on with what William started here. We decided it was a, uh, a pre-Reformation altar stone. Got these wonderful historic buildings and it's our job to pass them on to the next generation in a better state in which we found them. People have been drawn together, whether they're church girls or not, have been drawn together because of his enthusiasm and in his interest. Um, we are extremely fortunate. God bless you, Willie. Okay, that's enough. Okay, let's go and sit down. Right, Mr. Nash, we need to check. They've all seen the, the altar, the coins, and the column inside.